Hey Unity Audio folks, there's an interesting game audio conundrum that was brought to my attention by Guy Somberg at the Audio Developer Conference this past year. So in games, 3D audio is usually handled with point sources, which are single points in world space that emit a sound from, generally spherically. The size of a sound is illustrated partially by the sound effect that's used itself. For instance, more bass in a sound effect would generally make you psychologically feel like the sound was larger. However, it's also handled through data, which has roots in electrical engineering in this case, using a process known as spread. And what spread is, is you're basically taking the sound source and you're distributing some of the power of that source to the ears that are not currently in focus or the, the listeners, the speakers. If you're in headphones, that means if the sound is here and you add spread to it, you're adding more of that signal to your other ear. If you're in surround sound, it is actually spreading it across the different speakers in the room. Along with spread, there's also distance attenuation, which only really comes into play when you're moving away from and closer to a sound. A larger sound will gen generally attenuate slower and it'll generally reach its sort of minimum attenuation. In other words, it's like full 360 degree spread point much sooner. In FMOD, for example, we use the spatializer to handle a lot of this. So on this waterfall event, I have a 1.2 unit minimum spread distance, which means that our size is two, or the size of our object is 2.4 units, and our maximum distance is 10 units. You can also control these manually. You can keep the same distance attenuation curve, such as what we're doing in this river event, but then adjust the sound size and extensions separately. And I actually will be doing some of that for the example that I'll be covering later in this video. However, that example can be applied outside of FMOD as well. So what Guy noted in his talk was that the point source pattern does not lend itself well to sound sources that aren't restricted to a spherical point. So a few examples of something like that would be raindrops, maybe a, a river or a conveyor belt. These sounds are contained in volumes or could be estimated with like a line instead of just a point. Physically speaking, each of these sounds is made up of hundreds, if not millions of individual little physical interactions. For instance, when you're hearing the rain, you're hearing each individual raindrop breaking on different materials. Same thing is happening with a river, you're hearing the, the air bubbles break the surface. And for a conveyor belt, you're hearing all of the little gears and cogs turning and any of the friction generated by the surface itself. So naturally we can't simulate that one-to-one -one realistically. We could maybe estimate it a little bit. We could break apart all of those physical interactions into little chunks and kind of place them across, say, place one conveyor belt sound every few feet or something, but that quickly adds up and gets pretty out of hand. So what I'll be covering is also what Guy was talking about in his talk a little bit, which is how we can use a single point source and a bunch of math to estimate the location and kind of average the location of our sound and then adjust our spread according to that relative to whatever object we're paying attention to. If you want to know more about this, um, I highly recommend reading Guy's book, uh, one of his books, The Game Audio Programmer Volume 2. All of this is covered, or a lot of this at least, is covered in tons of depth, including all of the math that goes into this in, uh, I believe it's chapter 12. So for the example I'll be covering, I'm going to be using a spline to estimate the positioning of a river. If you don't know what a spline is, it's essentially a three-dimensional curved line or adjustable line based on some individual node points. And this spline, essentially it wraps around our little water mill that we created. And I'm using it to generate a rough mesh that we'll be using as a visual representation of our river. As you can see, our mesh is super primitive. It's just using Unity's default material. So for our approach, basically I'm pulling the spline and in a set number of subdivisions of the spline, I'm estimating a line segment, which I'm using to draw to and basically measure against for the weighting of that line segment relative to our listener. I have a weighting equation that basically says the further away it is from our listener, the less value we should give it, the less we should pay attention to what it's doing as like an input. And then with the combination of all of those points, I am estimating where our sound source should be positioned, as well as 
how much spread it should have. In other words, how wide the source around it should be. So for example, I'm just gonna hit play here. I'm gonna set our listener to our, our average to mode. So for example, this, uh, this circle is our calculation radius. So any segment of the spline that's inside the circle is what we're paying attention to. And the sections that are closer to the center of the circle, we're giving more weight. So if we add all of these up, the position for our listener, or the position for our sound source, turns out should be about right here. And I'm using this little blue line to indicate our spread. So if I move our listener around, you'll notice that the yellow line shifts with it. There is a little bit of jitteriness with this approach. Um, I believe the reason for that is actually some floating point inaccuracies. The math that I'm using piggybacks off of Unity's Vector3 in quite a few places, and Vector3s fundamentally are made of both floats. I think a lot of the precision in this math would prefer that those were doubles. That's an alteration that you could make for your own project if you feel like it's necessary. I didn't feel like it was highly necessary at, for this demo, um, but I would probably put that into play if this was production code. So how are we doing this? Our first approach, as I said, is breaking up our spline into a bunch of individual lines. So if I select our listener here, I have this project to line segment script on it. This is where I'm doing basically all of the calculations. This resolution slider here is where we're setting how fine of a resolution we want to break our spline into. I'm setting it to 30 individual lines. So if I hit play again, if I zoom in on the underside so that the uh, mesh is being culled, you'll notice you can kind of see the breaks in these lines and their rough size. The reason I went with 30 is mostly for this little waterfall bit. If it was any shallower, that waterfall bit would be kind of chopped up and it would have some weird vertical idiosyncrasies to it. Um, but about, about at 30, it became smooth enough that it didn't really matter for my purposes. It is worth noting that this whole process can get fairly um, demanding on your CPU. Um, currently running this setup, we're not dropping a whole lot of frames. But if I turn this up to, say, 300 instead of 30, we're adding about 30 milliseconds to our calculation time, which puts it well over most reasonable thresholds. So as I was saying, the first step that we're doing is we're breaking up our spline into each of those individual line segments. And then from there, we are projecting to those line segments and finding the closest relative point on each one to our listener. And I have a debugging mode set up for that. Hit play. Any of these green lines indicates where our spline or where our line segments are being calculated towards, and any, any of the red one lines are outside of our calculation range and are being ignored other than the debug draw. So as I move this around, you can see this changes, and if you look at the ones on the very left end, as I move back and forth here, you'll notice they slide to match where the nearest point is as we move our object. So the function that we're using to get that nearest line segment is right here. I'm not going to go into too much detail about any of these functions. I'll leave some coding examples in the description of the video, but um, needless to say, these examples are all covered in guys material. So if you want way more detail on them, that would be the place to go. But essentially what we're doing here is we're using the dot product and some comparative math to return the nearest point on a given line segment. Now, what happens if a line is partially within our sphere of calculation? We need to handle that case. So what we're next doing is we are creating a function called clip line with sphere, which as it says, basically takes the line that we're given, checks to see if any of that line is outside of the edge of our calculation sphere. And if it is, it clips that end of the line to the radius of our calculation sphere. So it essentially shortens the line that we're calculating. It also has a Boolean return value. So we're using that to essentially say, hey, if this returns false, don't calculate the line at all. Essentially, if our squared distance to the line is greater than our radius, we're returning false. If it's not, then we calculate our external edges and return those as output vectors. So that whole calculation is great. It works. It does what it's supposed to. The next piece that we need is kind of our average attenuation directions. So from each of these lines, we need to run 
a weighting and calculate the spread, which turns out to be equivalent to our weighting in this case. Um, the math works out that way if you're using a unit circle. Our spread is a value from, unit, from zero to one. So uh, we can just multiply it by our radius to get sort of our actual spread value. The math for this gets pretty complicated. And essentially what we're doing is we're finding the average magnitude of every point along the line segment within calculation and using a bunch of calculus, finding the spread value for that and the average direction for that. So we're left with a new vector that is the average weighted direction and spread value of our old line. Hopefully this will make more sense if I show you a little demo of kind of what that looks like. So if we look at our listener now, each of these green lines here points to kind of the middle or the relative middle, the average location of a line. If the lines are scaled radially based on the Im relative impact that that segment has on the overall sound. And then these little blue vertical lines indicate how much spread those should be adding. So as we move this around, we'll see the whole structure itself kind of shifts. And for our final step, we are essentially solving the average of all of those to find our average direction, our average magnitude, and our average spread. Again, this is a ton of math, I'm not gonna go into it, but it's essentially just averaging all of what we found up here. So what that looks like is the single yellow line here. The green line is indicating where our closest point is as kind of a reference. It's a nice comparison to see the difference that we get using an averaged approach versus if we were to just use the first step, the linear approach. As you can see, from a point like this, we're actually closer to the line here, but the average sound is below us. Part of this is floating point error, and for my actual end result, I'm treating this like a 2D plane. There's some additional math I'd have to do if I wanted this to be truly kind of spherical. That doesn't matter so much unless we're using an output mode with a head-related transfer function. So for instance, if we're in VR and you can tilt your head, this would not fly. But for any kind of generic 3D game where your head's on a plane, this is fine. Um, so in my final calculation, I'm actually averaging the height of this to the closest point height. So the height of our sound will be at the river's level at the closest point, even if the spread direction and kind of emitter direction is a little bit different. So for a quick demo of what this sounds like, I'm just gonna go ahead and walk around a little bit in our game. And this point here, I think, is a really great indicator of where the average comes into play. As you can see, the river ends in front of us. We can see the river, but the majority of the river is to our right. And so we're hearing most of the sound out of this right ear. Cool. And there we have a pretty functional spline to single audio emitter implementation. There's a, again, there's a ton of math in this. I highly recommend checking out um, Guy Somberg's books if you want to know more about this type of thing. And I'm going to also link a uh, cat-like coding tutorial if you want to know more about splines and how I put together this particular spline. If you have any additional questions about this implementation or any other kind of technical audio things, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to talk about them. Until next time, hope you're all having a great week and I'll see you around.